Hey everybody, welcome to my video on describing plate motions with vectors. This picture shows a ground-mounted GPS unit that's continually collecting the location of this point on Earth's surface relative to a satellite in space. GPS has been a real revolution for plate tectonics because it allows us to see how all the different pieces of each plate are moving relative to each other in real time. And in this video, we're going to describe how we can describe those motions using vectors. So first, I want to talk about how plate motions are determined and how we display them with vectors. Then I'll talk a little bit about how all plate motions must be defined relative to a fixed reference frame. But that fixed reference frame can change. And finally, we'll look at how we can break vectors into east and west components. So I just told you that GPS has been a revolution for measuring plate motions. And I'll just show you one example here. This is from a GPS station that sits just east of the San Andreas Fault. And it's been measuring the velocity of this location for many years. And what you can see is that over time, the station was being pulled slowly northward uh, along with the California crust. However, when the San Andreas Fault ruptured, the plate suddenly moved southward very rapidly uh, during the earthquake. And that co-seismic motion is actually recorded by the GPS unit. Pretty amazing. Another big way that we know plate motions is by using magnetic anomalies of the seafloor. So as seafloor spreading between two plates occurs, uh, the cooling rocks record the direction of the magnetic field in the rocks. And because that magnetic field reverses direction every so often, those get recorded as magnetic stripes on the seafloor. If we can tie these reversals to, no, the, to the timing of known magnetic reversals, we can then use that to compute a rate of seafloor spreading. So based on maps of these magnetic anomalies, we essentially know the direction and the rate of seafloor spreading over time, which is really the direction and rate of that one plate is moving relative to another plate. So this is a really important way that we know plate motions over long time scales. And these can also be described as a vector. So how do we describe plate motions as a vector? Here's a few of the fundamental ideas. So a vector is just an arrow, OK? And the orientation of the arrow, or the angle, uh, shows the direction that one plate or one moving object is moving relative to some fixed reference frame. Okay. Likewise, the length of the vector is scaled to show how fast the object is moving. So longer vector arrows denote faster objects. And usually there's a scale that helps us figure that out. In this example, an arrow of this length is equivalent to a velocity of one millimeter per year. So if we scale that over here, this longer arrow is roughly three of these. So we know that this longer arrow represents about three millimeters per year of velocity. And we know that the object is moving in the direction specified by this angle. We're going to see at the end of this video that a vector of any given orientation and length can be decomposed into two perpendicular vectors, usually along an x and a y axis, or along an east and a north axis. And very, very importantly, this vector must always be drawn relative to a fixed origin. Okay, So the tip is moving relative to something that we're going to hold fixed. And now I'll show you three ways that we can define a fixed reference frame. One way, common in plate tectonics, is simply to hold one plate fixed and show a second plate moving relative to it. So in this case, we'll hold South America fixed as our origin, and we'll draw a velocity vector that shows Africa moving away from it at some direction and rate. And this is an, a natural thing to do, especially when you're working with data from uh, seafloor spreading, right? 
because we don't know exactly the, the velocity of this ridge. The ridge itself could be moving in some direction. But we do know that if we hold South America fixed, Africa is moving this way at some rate that is defined by the magnetic anomalies. So this is, this is a common approach if you're dealing with seafloor spreading data. Another approach is to describe plate motion relative to some fixed coordinate system. For example, a latitude and longitude grid, okay? Or if you work in the GPS world, you'll often take your fixed grid as being the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, or the ITRF. And this is especially useful for GPS data because GPS inherently is measured from space and it's inherently an absolute motion relative to some terrestrial reference frame. So in this example, if we had a GPS station on Africa, we could describe how it was moving relative to a fixed latitude longitude grid. For example, relative to the fixed coordinates of zero, zero that do not change and aren't moving. And here's an example of some GPS velocity vectors showing how India is moving northward relative to Eurasia. I should say relative to a fixed reference frame. <laughs> Okay, now finally, we can essentially take any other moving object whose motion is known and use it as our fixed reference frame. And this is something you might call relative velocities. Um, and one way this is done commonly is, for example, people will often want to compare the velocity of some vector uh, relative to stable North America or relative to stable Eurasia. When we think about tectonics, it's often useful to compare velocities of continents around the edges to, to some point in their interior that is stable, okay? So in this case, a bunch of geodesists get together and they look at how the interior of North America is moving relative to a fixed reference frame, like the ITRF, and then they pick some vector that is representative of roughly how the interior of North America is moving in that absolute reference frame. And then what we can do is if we have any other vectors that we want to compare to interior North America, we just subtract off the SNARF or the stable North American reference frame from those. And we'll look at that at the very end of this video. So I'll close this video by talking about how we can break vectors into their east and west components using a little bit of vector algebra. Okay, so as I said earlier, here's our velocity vector, Africa moving away from some fixed coordinate. So we'll call that V. And we can break V into two perpendicular vectors. We'll call it Vx, which is essentially in an east-west direction. And we'll call it Vy essentially in a north-south direction. So literally, the motion of Africa can be described by summing these. If, if we move x number of spaces in this direction, and then we move y number of spaces up in this direction, we're going to accomplish the same thing as if we just move some other number in this direction. Okay? So we can literally sum the vectors in a tip-to-tail fashion in order to describe v. Likewise, if we want to know the length of v, that can be given by the Pythagorean theorem. Simply x squared plus y squared equals v squared, OK? Because we know this is a right triangle. Or we can always solve for azimuth or length of v using trigonometry. For example, uh, cosine theta is equal to vx over v. So we can, we can use tangent, cosine, sine to either solve for the angles or sine for the missing vector lengths, whatever you need. So for example, Catalina Island offshore of Los Angeles on the Pacific plate is moving northwestward at a velocity of 44 millimeters per year. Okay, And we can deconvolve that into a motion of 31 millimeter per year east and 31.6 millimeter per year north. 
Note that we're describing this as negative 31 millimeter per year to the east. And that's simply because in the, in the, the coordinate system we've defined, negative motions uh, would be to the west and positive motions would be to the east. So I actually meant to say this is moving west. <laughs> um, and likewise, positive motions are to the north and negative motions are going to be to the south in this particular coordinate system. So I'll close with a final example. What if we want to understand the motion of one GPS velocity relative to another GPS velocity? So both things are moving in an absolute reference frame, and we essentially want to pick one of them to hold fixed. How do we do this mathematically? Let's use this example. Here's a bunch of GPS stations that are on the Pacific plate and the North American plate. Um, this is the San Andreas Fault right here, and this is the San Jacinto Fault right here. So we're in Southern California, and notice that the San Jacinto Fault is active. So stations on the west side, like station 742, are moving a bit faster than stations on the east side, like station 491. They're going in the same direction, but 742 is moving faster to the north to the northwest. So suppose we want to ask the question, how is station 742 moving relative to station 491? All we need to do is take the east and northern components for 742 and literally subtract off the east and northern components for station 491. So for the northings, 33 minus 23 is 10 and minus 26 minus 6 is minus 20. So this is now the northing and the easting velocities of station 742 relative to station 491. And so if we convert that into a single vector, it looks like this. 742 actually isn't moving that quickly relative to 491. Uh, only about a third of its total velocity is relative to 491. So in summary, plate motions can be determined by GPS or by magnetic anomalies at spreading ridges. Plate motions can always be expressed as a vector whose angle shows the direction and whose length is proportional to velocity. That, that plate motion or that vector motion must always be described relative to a fixed reference frame. So that could either be some terrestrial reference frame, like a latitude and longitude grid that's held fixed, or we could hold another tectonic plate or another GPS station fixed. But something has to be fixed. Vectors can be broken down and expressed as the sum of two perpendicular vectors, for example, east and west and north and south. And their magnitude and azimuth can be determined using trigonometry. And finally, we showed that the relative motions between two GPS vectors can be determined by subtracting the east and west components of one from the other. I'll leave you with these concept questions, and we'll see you in class.